So what is the course about? Uh, the topic is rare event estimation. So to summarize it, it's calculating small probabilities using computers, more or less. So I'll put say, the classical uh, kind of problem in this, is, and you can usually reformulate any rare event problem as just uh, the probability of some random variable x uh, exceeding a very large threshold gamma. And uh, what, what is actually, how do you define rare? What, what is rare and what is not rare? Uh, there's no real definition here, but just to just as an example, something like a probability in in the scale of ten to the minus four or ten to the minus down to ten to the minus fifteen or beyond, that's definitely a, a rare event. Um, so one problem of this type is like this probability I just mentioned, the survival function, or things like this uh, expectation, which is basically in the event that some uh, X takes on a large value. What is its expected value in that in that scenario? So this will look like an expect, expected shortfall type of equation. So applications are to all kinds of reliability um, systems, uh, kinds of problems. You need to operate a nuclear power reactor, and you want to make sure that nothing you have no meltdowns with some infinitesimal probability or or you're operating a dam, or you want to know the probability of a, uh, a hurricane, a, a once-in-a-lifetime hurricane or something like that. So my imagination is not too great on this, but I'm sure you can think of many things that are not very common. Um, and so all through insurance, for example, if you're, you're writing a contract to cover some whole country against catastrophic weather loss, this might be something you could, you could use. Or if you're just a, a normal... Uh, insurer, you're, you're aggregating losses over um, many customers and, and their claims over a year, for example, and you need to calculate uh, quantities such as the value at risk, which is an extreme quantile to say uh, in the, say, 1% worst day or worst year, how much will I be losing? <coughs> uh, so, or there's lots of uh, situations you can come up with in finance where, uh, it's, for example, option pricing. So this is the payoff for a European put option, I believe. So the idea is <coughs> uh, if your, your stock price is staying, starts at 100, follows some uh, stochastic process, and your strike price for your option is much higher than your starting price, then you say the option is, is heavily out of the money. And so to um, to calculate that kind of thing you, you, uh, accurately can make or, or break in terms of your, your trading strategy. Uh, so this is just that same example again with uh, a thousand simulations here. The ones that are grayed out are the ones that didn't make it up to the strike price and the the colored ones are the ones that did. So only six out of a thousand. Or, um, uh, so that's not a particularly rare event. Uh, but if you can imagine that threshold, that K becoming higher and higher, then these things will happen less and less often. So this, the next simulation is two out of a thousand, so on. <coughs> or Similar to, to that is uh, like the exotic options that you have. So if you want to price something that uh, starts at down here at uh, at 100, but it has to drop below some level before it activates, and then has to also cross some high level to pay off above the strike price. That's another situation that's quite rare, and these are these are commonly traded. Um, so yeah, more plots. Um, so I guess I'll just point out um, what I see as the difference between statistics and probability and, and, and say that there won't be any statistics in, in this class. Uh, so in, in rare event estimation, you're, you're typically going through the process of um, starting with some, some data, creating a model from it, so that is the basically the process of statistics in here, going from data to model. And then once you have a model already fitted, then calculating something that you actually care about, I would say that's using probability. 
So we'll be focusing on sort of this half of the equation. And uh, that's in contrast to a lot of um, sort of modern statistics is to, to try to get away with having a model at all, just use the data directly to calculate the things that you're interested in. Um, but I, I'd say in the rare event case, that's extremely hard. Uh, whenever you're not using a model, you're, you're effectively saying that the probability of something happening is basically how often it's happened in the past, the historical frequency of, of the event. So um, I guess who's heard of the like a black swan event? It's uh, only one. Oh, wow, okay, I thought you'd all heard of this. So the, the story goes that um, um, uh, before Australia was discovered by Europeans, they never realized that you could actually have a swan that was black uh, occurring in nature. So if you'd gone back to, you know, 1600s and asked these scientists what's the probability of finding a black swan, they would have said zero. Like, that is just impossible. And it's just because they hadn't experienced it themselves. It wasn't that it was impossible, but they just didn't even know that it could happen. So this is um, a common uh, story that's told about uh, uh, making this mistake, basically, just uh, assuming something that hasn't happened before can never happen again. So think to the great uh, financial crisis in 2008-9, no one thought the housing prices could all go down together at the same time. It's, because it had never happened before. So this is a similar kind of event. <laughs> so I would argue that that's uh, one reason why you, you really need to stick with models that, that uh, never put you in this situation of saying that your probability of your rare event is just nothing. Just ignore it. It's impossible because that will lead to some terrible outcomes. So how to... Um, there's a, a, a sequence of methods that you can use to um, to solve these problems, and each one is sort of better than the next one. So in the case where you actually have a really simple model and you can just solve the, the problem you're after using algebra calculus, then definitely just do it. Like, really, really simple one. Like, if we're taking this probability here, uh, probability that a Pareto random variable is over a threshold. You know that's just the integral of its density. So depending on how you define a Pareto random variable. Uh, integral from gamma to infinity alpha on x to the alpha plus 1 dx. And so you can calculate that out to be 1 on x to the alpha evaluate between the endpoints, gamma and infinity. And get the result that you're after. Your probability is uh, in a closed form, one on gamma to the power of alpha. So if this option is available to you, then uh, yeah, definitely this is the best way to solve any of these problems. Um, because it doesn't matter if your thing you care about is a rare event or not. If you can if you can get a closed form solution, then that's the the gold standard. But uh, it's pretty easy to get into models or, or problems that you want to ask that don't have closed form solutions, and you're pretty much stuck. So um, just that same example modified a little bit. If you if you try to do the same thing for um, the probability that uh, x1 plus x2, both being um, independent, identically distributed Pareto alpha variables. Uh, what's that probability? Well, you'd have to turn it into an integral, a double integral over the density. x1, x2. And that thing, I'm quite certain, doesn't have a, a closed form solution. Um, if you if you did know of one, I'd love to hear it, but I'm pretty certain this thing doesn't have a closed form solution. So we've only made a very slight modification to our model, and already the, the first our, 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 our new algebraic solution is out the window. So we're starting to approximate things now. So the next best thing I would say is if you can approximate 
you, you turn your problem into an integral, your rare event problem, your, your expectation, whatever it is, just look at it as an integral. It's always an integral. And you can use some kind of uh, numerical integration technique. So that is, you take your integral and uh, turn it into some kind of summation. Uh, so sum from r equals 1 to n of some weight that you need to choose and then the function your integrand evaluated at some point xi for uh, now that uh, how do you choose the the weights and the and these nodes well that's the the hard part but all numerical integrations take this form here so just to show you some like i'm i'm quite certain that I, I was even taught some of these in high school, so uh, I'm sure this will ring a bell. Like the Riemann rule, for example, how Riemann integrals are defined. So you can, here's just some example. Um, I just dragged it from my PhD thesis because I, I couldn't be bothered remaking it. It's just some random um, curvy function f that we're trying to, to integrate, which is this blue line. And uh, you split up the region of integration into a grid of size h. So that's what this thing is. And then take the value of the function at the middle of that grid and assume that you've, you've got to calculate the area of these rectangles underneath here and say that's an approximation for the area under the blue curve. So. And then this is the most simple one, and then they get more complicated and complicated from here. But they're all the same idea, uh, evaluating the function at some specific points and then adding them up in a smart way. So I guess the next best thing is the trapezoidal rule. Again, this thing I'm pretty sure was in high school for, for at least for Australians. Uh, so instead of making the rectangles, you, you make trapezoids here. So in your grid, you take the value um, of the function at each end of your grid points and, and create these trapezoids and calculate the area here which is in green as an approximation to the area into the, into the blue curve and so on. Simpson's rule, another one from high school, you, you've, you've basically fit quadratics to little sections of your of your function and from there they just get smarter and smarter. The, the modern uh, numerical integration algorithms are just uh, mind-blowingly complicated and uh, I have huge respect for those people that make those things. Uh, but there's the problem that uh, you can very quickly uh, hit situations where these routines fail totally and that, that comes about when you're looking at high dimensional problems. So um, as I was writing before, just to do a one dimensional problem is a sum i equals 1 to, to n, so n is your sort of accuracy parameter, increase that and you get more and more accurate. Um, and so, but then to do a, a two-dimensional integral, you, you have to make a double sum, so i equals 1 to n, j equals 1 to n, wi, wj, F evaluated at x i y j, and so now that function that we're evaluating is now done x squared. No, sorry, n squared times, and uh, you can see that this, as the dimension increases, then you're going to have exponentially many computations to to come up with an approximation to your integral. So this is. Uh, called uh, the curse of dimensionality and sort of the the formal way to, to, to look at that is um, if you need your integral approximation to, to have some fixed error and you say, how many times do I need to evaluate the integrands to get that fixed error? Uh, that thing grows exponentially in terms of the dimension. So some constant to the power of d, where the d is here, 
uh, d equals two, d equals one. So the next uh, best solution is to come up with some Monte Carlo uh, approach. So um, also called integration by darts, which I'll uh, maybe explain in a moment. So I, uh, I've been told that you guys uh, studied this very recently with um, Ying, Ying Zhao, was your professor? So yes, the first semester. First semester, so within the last couple of months. Yes. So hopefully you guys didn't jettison all that knowledge as soon as the exam's finished, but uh, you'll be needing it. Um, so uh, I'll, today is mainly a recap of um, things, things I assume you know, at least the first hour. I'm assuming you know most of the stuff I'll be presenting. And then we'll have an hour of exercises just to make sure that you, you guys haven't forgotten the programming side. And then the following hour will be some new algorithm, which I doubt you'll have seen. Um, so the simplest Monte Carlo solution is for this problem of, of, of finding L, the, the survival probability, is to simulate um, capital R uh, replications which are uh, independent and identically distributed from the distribution of X and then just go through each of them and, and ask the question, is this one is this one greater than our threshold gamma or not? Count up how many there are divided through by capital R. So the, the nice thing about this, um, uh, so I'll just point out, so I'll be using these, uh, the hats to denote a, an S, a Monte Carlo estimator. So this thing is uh, now a random variable and, and its mean is the, the true value that we want to approximate. So it's unbiased. So, just doing some simple example, we can, uh, maybe you've seen this example also, you can use Mon crude Monte Carlo to estimate the value of pi. Uh, so, you take x and y to be standard uniform random variables, and uh, you look at the probability that the, um, that the uh, radius is less than or equal to one, and then so, so the estimator is again the sample mean r equals one to r of uh, the indicator that the rth variable satisfies. the event. So you can also calculate this probability using some geometry. So effectively you're, you're calculating the probability of, of, of falling inside a quadrant of uh, the unit circle. And so the probability of this happening is just the, the ratio of the areas. So the, pro, uh, the area of the, of, um, this quadrant is pi r squared uh, divided by four, and the area of the of the unit square is just one squared. So you know that the the value of l is actually pi on four. So you can you can work backwards and saying you know the estimator is approximately equal to the true value, and then turn that around and say pi is approximately equal to four times this Monte Carlo estimator. So let's try to write some code for this. So I should have asked also, what um, programming languages are you guys more, most comfortable with? So is it mainly say R or MATLAB or Python? R, R mainly R, some some Python. You're in luck because these examples will be in Python. <laughs> um, and uh, it for for your oh, you you'll be doing some quiz exercises. You'll choose whatever programming language you want. It um, 
and I'll, I'll come around and try to help out if there's any software errors, but uh, unfortunately R I'm not particularly strong on. I know Python and MATLAB very well, but um, we'll work it out. So um, let's just try to do this example, the, the, the simple one, um, calculating pi. So just import the, uh, the libraries that you need set the number of replications that you want so we'll take a million and uh, draw the uniform random variables uh, so we want an r by two matrix of these so to calculate the norms of them you can uh, use uh, some numpy built-in thing to calculate the norms along the uh, second axis, I believe. The axis equals one. Um, look at whether the norms are above our threshold or not. And then uh, your estimator, estimators are four times that those indicators. And let's see if that works the first time. It never does. Nope. Nothing crashed. Yeah, so that kind of looks like pi. 3.1405, etc. So um, I'll try to just quickly plot what is actually happening here. Um, so we'll take the first, say, thousand um, uniform vectors and just plot them out and uh, give them a different color for whether they fall inside the unit square or not, uh, inside the quadrant or not. So this is just making the colors for each of the different points. Um, making a plot that is square, otherwise they default to be a, some rectangle which looks disgusting. And uh, so we plot the the first coordinate of the random of the uniforms. Against the second and the color is those colors that we want. So these are the first, say, thousand uniforms and the uh, colored. You go through and count all the red ones, which are the ones which satisfy your event and, and calculate them as a ratio of the number in total that you have. So um, one nice part about having a Monte Carlo estimator is you get for free some confidence intervals surrounding them. So um, here is the that same uh, process for increasing the number of uh, replicants you're using. So starting off with just 10, 100, 1,000, up to a million. And you can see the, the value of pi is getting, or your estimate of pi is getting closer and closer. And at the same time, the confidence interval, so this is showing 
the lower confidence interval and the, and the upper confidence interval for the different estimates. Um, by the time you're using a million samples, the, the lower confidence interval uh, agrees with the upper confidence interval only to two decimal places. And so that's what this uh, table at the bottom here shows is that if you even if you take, if you want pi estimated uh, using this method accurate to four um, decimal places with 95% confidence, then you need to take quite a large sample size. So where do these confidence intervals come from? So again, I hope this is a reminder. So um, you want, you, you have the fact that your true value um, is within your Monte Carlo estimate, subtract away this value here, and then less than or equal to your Monte Carlo estimate plus the same width with the probability one minus alpha. And so the Q here is just some quantile of the standard normal and uh, the sigma is the, uh, the sigma squared is the variance of, the, of a R equals one single uh, replicate from Monte Carlo. Uh, so where does this come from? That's just a result. It's a, it's not a it's not a strong result. It's only an approximate. They're only approximate confidence intervals, and it's because if you if you look at, nope, oh, come back. Uh, a huge amount of replications. The central limit theorem kicks in. So your estimator subtract away the mean, which is the true value, all scaled up by square root of r, that thing converges in distribution to uh, a normal variable mean zero uh, and uh, variance sigma squared. So therefore you can rearrange this and say that your, the estimator itself um, is uh, approximately distributed as a, as a normal random variable with mean, the true value, and with variance sig sigma squared divided by r. And that's where these approximate confidence of an intervals come from, that result. So, what conclusions can you draw from from that? Uh, on the one hand, uh, these these confident the width of the confidence interval, which is basically the accuracy of of crude Monte Carlo, it's the same regardless of how the, the dimension of the problem. So, if uh, the, the problem I just showed you before was two dimensional of the of the throwing throwing um, uniforms inside the quadrant or inside the unit square, so. In one sense, that's great news. Uh, we, we're doing much better than uh, numerical integration, which was degraded very badly when the dimension increased. Um, but it's also bad news that it's all uh, crude Monte Carlo was always very slow to get a, a accurate result, uh, and uh, things just get even worse in the case where you're looking at rare events. So. Um, if you look at the relative error, for example, um, so of an estimator, it's defined as the, the distance of the estimate from the true value in absolute value scaled by the true value. Uh, so another way to write that is just the numerator here is, is squared and then square rooted, just to, just, just another way to write the um, absolute value. And then the, the definition of relative error in rare events is you using, based off this, it's basically the square root of the expected value of the estimator subtract the real value squared divided by um, the true value. And so that can be simplified a little bit as is actually the variance of the estimator uh, divided by 
uh, L squared. So, um, so what can what do we know about this? Uh, we know that the Monte Carlo estimator is a summation of indicators. So, if you multiply your Monte Carlo estimator by um, the number of replicators R, well, maybe I'll just write this out quickly. So the your L hat looks like this, as some indicators here. If you multiply that thing by R, you just get the summation. And so you know that that thing has a, a distribution which is binomial distributed, um, where your, your number of attempts is capital R, and your probability of success is the, the value L that you're trying to estimate. And so you can calculate that this quantity r times the estimator its variance has to be what does it have to be r times l times 1 minus l and so you can plug that in to this formula here and you can conclude that the the relative error for a crude Monte Carlo estimator is 1 minus L divided by RL. And uh, if you're looking at situations where L is extremely small, then the 1 minus L is approximately the same as just 1. So you can say your relative error is approximately the square root of 1 on R times L, the true value. So there's, uh, this is not good news if you're trying to estimate these, these um, rare events. So in the limit, you can say when the event becomes rarer and rarer, L goes down to zero, and then your relative error, because L is on the denominator here, your relative error just goes up to infinity um, for, for a fixed number of replicates R. So for a, a specific example, say that you're trying to estimate something that's of the order 10 to the minus 6, and you want to have your, your relative error has to be relatively small, 0.01, um, then if you plug that into this approximation here and rearrange, you find out that you need 10 to the 10 Monte Carlo estimate, uh, replicates to, to get this relative error for for this rare problem. So is that um everyone happy with that so far? No? Is there any questions you want to ask? Okay, well is it just you can't read my handwriting at all? <laughs> Sorry? Oh no, yeah, it's terrible. Most of these things are just I should tell you right away, any numerical Monte Carlo method is terrible, but I'll be teaching you a few anyway, because <laughs> there's no other options. So, um, so next comes the um, the most uh, central tool, I would say, of, of the next few hours of class, which is important sampling. And so the trick is, instead of using... Um, Estimating that uh, x is greater than gamma using the original distribution that it came from, you you look at it as this expectation of the indicator uh, so here I'll just write in in small letters here underneath the the expectation operator the letter f to to reinforce that x is distributed as that from that density f and so this first line is just showing what what a standard um, uh, crude Monte Carlo estimator is, is based on that I should say some based on, on on the original density but um, if you write out 
what this integral is here, the expectation of the indicator little x is greater than gamma uh, multiplied by the density f so that's what the integral actually looks like and then important sampling says let's just multiply this by one so it, it takes some other density g of x and just throws it into the integrand here in the numerator and denominator f of x on g of x and then so if you not really doing anything if you just change your perspective you say now we're looking at f of x divided by g of x multiplied by g of x so nothing nothing happened there just uh, rearranging how we how we look at it and then we can say that this is now some function the expectation of some function with respect to the density g so if you take the expectation in terms of g of the indicator x is greater than gamma and then you also have this other term in here which is called the likelihood ratio Yeah, I should write that somewhere. And so this hasn't actually changed anything, which has re rewritten the expectation. But then it, to put it into some kind of Monte Carlo estimator, you replace the expectation with the sample mean. And that's where you get the important sampling estimator. So, except now instead of sampling from the original density, you have sampled from some new thing which is called the, the proposal density or the important sampling proposal density G. So you can pretty you're quite flexible with what you can throw in here for your specific choice of G it can be you, there's one thing you have to make sure is that um, what I've written here basically that um, if you if you look at the integrand and you'll notice that suddenly you have g of x on the on the denominator, you don't want that to become zero and, and for things to be undefined and get in infinity. So g of x can become zero, but only um, only when places when this indicator is zero anyway. So it, 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 you never get to that region. Uh, so that's got some fancy name like absolute continuity of f with respect to g but I or g with respect to f and I always forget it so it's not so important but uh, I guess what is important is uh, does this help you with your problem or not um, so you know that both of these ways of estimating your rare event have the same answer in expectation so they're both the expected value of your crude Monte Carlo and your in important sampling are both the true value L that you want to estimate and so that's always true and what you want is that you you've done your fancy important sampling and you want the variance of that thing to be less than the variance of just doing the really stupid crude Monte Carlo and this fact is not always true actually you can you can choose um, you can choose proposal densities for important sampling that make it worse than just doing crude Monte Carlo. You can you can go backwards, as it were. So um, this is a problem that is in your quiz for later today to recreate these plots. So I'll, I'll make sure I explain them properly right now. And that is the example is uh, if you have a multivariate normal distribution, just a two-dimensional normal. Um, both of the marginal distributions are standard normal, so uh, 
individually, they're just not one, but they have a correlation between them of 0.8. So just describing what this x vector is. So you have this x which is multivariate normal and you take the maximum value of those two coordinates. What's the probability that that maximum is above 10? So um, if you use important sampling and you set the, the g density here to be um, for various, for various um, you do this multiple times, and you set it to be the, the density of a, of a normal distribution with uh, uh, variance 1. Sorry, I should have said this a bit differently. If you, instead of the vector coming from that normal distribution, under the important sampling, make sure it comes from the mu comma mu multivariate normal with the same uh, correlation structure. So, in effect, uh, if you if you increase mu, then you're increasing um, you're increasing the probability that the the maximum is going to get over the threshold. So you think intuitively, I should increase mu as much as possible so that this maximum here is always above the threshold. And then if the plot on the left here is showing the results for the different important sampling estimates. So the x-axis here is how much you've shifted it by, the value of mu. And so each point represents the outcome of a different important sampling estimator. And the y-axis is the, the actual estimator itself, what did it say the probability is approximately. And so this plot is not so interesting, basically you just want to see that they all agree with each other, you haven't made any error in the code. <laughs> Obviously this plot doesn't really look like all those lines are so close, but the axis is actually zoomed in quite a lot, all these estimates are 0 0.0023 something, something. So. Um, they're all saying the same answer more or less but then on the other side here the plot shows you the the variance of the different estimators well I should say the sample variance and this is in a sense a, a measure of the performance so you, the, the less variance you have the better your important sampling estimator and you can see that for, for a while if you increase mu you get to this point, sort of magical point, where you have the least possible variance. And then if you go too far, then you, you end up going backwards and you're making, you make things worse for yourself. So um, this is, yeah, as I said, you guys will be doing this in about 10 minutes anyway, so you'll, you'll understand this plot very, very well. So I guess one question you can ask is, what is the absolute best important sampling proposal density uh, there is? And uh, so it turns out that there's actually a result for this. So we'll call G star of X to be the absolute best important sampling density that you can make. And it turns out to be um, proportional to uh, the original density conditioned on the rare event are happening. So the indicator x is greater than gamma multiplied by the original density f. So, yeah, didn't think that through. So if you integrate that out, however, the actual uh, normalization constant unfortunately is this this uh, L that you're trying to estimate so you know you can write down exactly what is the perfect proposal distribution but you can't use it because to use it you need to know the thing that you don't know that you're trying to estimate in the first place so this thing is it has some cool uh, well not cool but 
useful um, theoretical applications. That's what I'm telling you now. But it's not a, a directly applicable thing um, that you can use. So, okay, so what did I want to say here? So if you look at uh, just if you sample just one random variable using the perfect important sampling density G star, you get an unbiased estimate which is zero variance, which is kind of a bizarre thing. So let's look at that. So the estimator itself is um, the indicator that our event happened and then multiplied by the likelihood ratio f divided by g star at x1 but given that g star itself is this um, indicator x is greater than gamma f of x. So if you plug in the actual value for g star into here to simplify it, you get indicator x1 is greater than gamma, original density at f1 divided by indicator, oh, I've got the normalization constant there, <coughs> indicator x1 is greater than gamma, f of x1 divided by L and so uh, here everything cancelled except for the that L which comes to the top so this is showing that in this magical world where you you could use the absolute best important sampling estimator it wouldn't be an approximation at all it would it would give you the perfect answer that you're looking for there'd be no variability you wouldn't need to do multiple replications you just do one and it would just give you the perfect answer and so this really is the absolute best you could do in terms of important sampling.